Hi guys, so I welcome you all to the today's lecture under the fast track series for RBI grade B 2018 which has been brought to you guys by EduTap. Before proceeding forward, let us briefly look at what this series entails for you guys. So in this particular series, we are going to attain a comprehensive coverage of current affairs from the month of May 2018 to 15th August 2018 that is before your examination. And again in this particular series we are going to alternatively cover topics of ESI that is economic and social issues and finance and management which will be covered through important problems under multiple choice questions or MCQs. Now we have been working in this direction for the past few years and we have been blessed with some of the very amazing results in the past few years. Now in RPA grade B 2017 results 124 of our students they reached the interview stage and 27 of the students they made it to the final list. Now apart from the different other courses which we are running we are offering these courses for RBA grade B 2018 examination so these are the different courses which you guys can choose from so there is a wide range of courses and you can choose according to your requirement. Now in case you need to know more, you have any query, you can always visit our website which is www.edutab.co.in or you can drop us a mail at deepak at the rate edutab.co.in or you can call us at 8146-207-241. In this video, we are going to cover some of the very important current affairs, current news and current events from the 5th of June 2018 to 9th of June 2018. So let's start with the first news which is the announcement of rupees 8500 crore bailout package for sugar industry. So recently the union cabinet it has approved a 8500 crore bailout package for the sugar industry. So the cabinet has provided this boost to the sugar industry and this 8500 crore includes a 4500 crore soft loan. Now soft loans are those which have uh, which have very favorable terms, very liberal terms in case of interest payments and this is for building ethanol production capacity and creating a 3 million ton stockpile to soak up excess supply. So here we are focusing on ethanol production and creating a stockpile to soak up excess supply. Also the cabinet has approved a rupees 1300 crore interest subvention. So this is another aspect of this funding interest subvention on the loans which are to be provided for new ethanol production capacity as well as expanding the existing capacities. Now the ethanol which will be extracted from the sugar cane it is going to be blended in petrol. So this is important we are going to blend the ethanol with petrol and this is going to provide the farmers the sugar cane farmers a remunerative price for their crop. Further this ethanol mixing in petrol it will also help the country in cutting its oil imports because now we will be uh, mixing oil and this ethanol petrol and this ethanol so we'll be needing less amount of petrol now center has already doubled the sugar import duty to 100 percent and it has scrapped the excess uh, export duty to check the sliding domestic prices with respect to sugar industry so this package has been announced for the sugar industry and we must obtain a broader idea of this package that this package entails boosting the ethanol production and to mix it with petrol and to boost the overall sugar industry in the country. Now this is a very important term with respect to the sugar industry in India that is fair and remunerative price. So what happens is the government has decontrolled the sugar industry partially in 2013 and it has allowed the industry to produce to sell their produce in open market but the sugar industry also faces a problem that is the price of its raw material and the raw material for sugar industry is as we all know sugar cane and this price is fixed by the state and the central governments and it is state advised price in case of state governments and fair and remunerative price in case of central governments. So the price of the raw material for the sugar industry it is decided by the government center or state. Now FRP that is fair remunerative price is it is the existing arrangement for the price to be paid to the sugarcane farmers by the sugar mills and this price is announced each year by the center. So this is the price which the sugar mills will pay sugarcane farmers but this price is not decided by them it is decided by center. 
and this is decided by center under the sugar cane control order on the advice of CACP that is the commission for agricultural costs and prices which is also involved in the announcement of MSPs that is minimum support prices as the minimum price of sugar cane. However, the many states in North India, they are also announcing a state advised price under state legislation. So, FRP is by center and SAP is by states. Generally, this SAP is substantially higher than the FRP and therefore, wherever SAP is declared, it is the ruling price. So, mill owners, they have to pay, they are obligated to pay this SAP to farmers. Now let's move to the next one which is about the insolvency and bankruptcy code amendment ordinance 2018. So this ordinance has been recently promulgated and it seeks to amend the insolvency and bankruptcy code which came into being in 2016. Now this insolvency and bankruptcy code it provides a time bound process for resolving insolvency in the companies and among the individuals. Now this insolvency it is a situation where individuals or companies they are not able to pay their debt they are not able to pay their obligations pay their loans now in this case the financial creditors is a very important term associated with this code this code defines financial creditors as those persons to whom the company or the, uh, the person in concern under the ibc it owes a financial debt now these are the key highlights of the amendments which have been brought in through this ordinance. The first one is about a representative of financial creditors. Now this ordinance that allows the financial creditors to appoint some authorized representatives on their behalf. Now such authorized representatives they will participate and vote in the meetings of the committee of creditors which is there to approve the different uh, processes with regard to the resolution of insolvency so they are going to participate and they are going to act as per the prior instructions which they will be getting from the persons who, who, to whom they will be representing uh, that is the creditors themselves the next is about voting threshold of the committee of creditors now with regard to this the code specifies that all decisions of the committee of creditors should be taken by majority of at least 75 percent of the financial creditors so the insolvency and bankruptcy code originally it specified that 75 percent decision making is required for taking decisions with regard to uh, insolvency resolution however this ordinance it has lowered this threshold to 51 percent so that easily decisions can be made or easily resolutions can be made however for certain decisions of the committee the voting threshold has been reduced from 75 percent to 66 percent so for some it is 51% and for some cases it is 66% and we have uh, some example of this 66% this, this include appointment and replacement of resolution professional, approval of resolution plan and approval of certain actions of the resolution professional. Now next is about ineligibility of a resolution applicant. So this code also provides the criteria with respect to ineligibility of a resolution applicant under this particular code. Uh, for example, it prohibits a person from being a resolution applicant if it has been convicted of an offence punishable with two or more years of imprisonment. However, this ordinance it relaxes the, these conditions a little bit and it says that this provision will apply only for certain specified offences and this is not going to apply after the two years from the date of release from imprisonment. Also, the code prohibits a person from being a resolution applicant if his account has been identified as NPA for more than a year. The ordinance, however, again, it provides a relaxation in this criteria. It provides that this criteria is not going to apply if that applicant is a financial entity and it is not a related party to the debtor with certain exceptions. So there is this relaxation for financial entities becoming the resolution applicant, which is expected to resolve the cases which are pending in this code uh, to a greater extent. Now next one is regarding applicability to MSME sector. Now this ordinance provides that ineligibility criteria for resolution applicants regarding NPAs and guarantors, they will not be applicable to persons who are applying for resolving the MSMEs. So we are hoping that MSMEs should be resolved faster. They, there should be not be much restrictions in resolution of MSME sector. So in this regard, this relaxation has been given. 
next one is about corporate resolution so this ordinance it provides that for a corporate ap applicant to initiate this insolvency resolution process they will have to submit a special resolution and this special resolution must be passed by at least three-fourths of the total number of partners of that corporate debtor so for corporate resolution a special resolution is required and the ordinance also specifies that with regard to implementation of resolution plans the nclt that is the national company law tribunal which is uh, one of the apex authorities under this insolvency and bankruptcy code this authority must ensure that a proper resolution plan it is in place for effective implementation before approving this plan now it also specifies that a resolution applicant may withdraw an application which has been filed which have been filed with the nclt that is national company law tribunal board after such process has been initiated such withdrawal have, will have to be approved by 90 percent vote of the committee of creditors so if the application is to be withdrawn then it requires 90 percent vote of the committee of creditors so these are about the different provisions with regard to the amendments made under the insolvency and bankruptcy code 2016. now next one is about the recent rbi's monetary policy review so monetary policy committee of rbi has recently released this monetary policy review and under this review the rbi has decided to hike the repo rate which is the short term lending rate to 6.25 percent from earlier 6 percent so now the repo rate has increased earlier it was 6% now it has become 6.25% so this is the most important aspect of this uh, this particular review that repo rate is now 6.25% now as per the second bi monthly monetary policy statement so this was the second bi monthly monetary policy statement the current policy rates of the rpa they are as follows the repo rate is 6.25% reverse repo is 6% marginal standing facility rate it is 6.5 percent now the recent rise of 25 basis points in the key policy rate is for the first time in the four and a half years since the present government was formed in may 2014. so this was the first time that the this government came into power and repo rate has increased now let us quickly look at all these important terms as they may be asked in the examination now repo rate this is very simple this is the rate of lending of the central bank or the rbi at which the central bank lends money to commercial banks in the events of any shortfall of funds so it is the rate at which rbi gives money to other banks and this rate is also used by monetary authority to control inflation so we can increase this rate if we feel that the inflation is increasing and we can do the necessary manipulations to manage the inflation in the economy now other one is the reverse repo rate and it is the rate at which the central bank borrows money from commercial banks and this is again a monetary policy instrument and it is used to control the money supply in the country next is the marginal standing facility now this is a new liquidity adjustment facility window and this was created by rpi in may 2011 now this is the rate this is the rate at which banks can borrow overnight funds from rbi against the approved government security so the banks can uh, get these securities with the rbi and on behalf of those securities the banks can obtain the loans at this marginal standing facility rate on overnight basis now next one is about the ipsa ministerial meet which was recently held at south africa so meeting between the external affairs ministers of india brazil and south africa which comprise the ipsa it was organized in Pretoria, South Africa recently and this ministerial summit was chaired by India's external affairs minister Sushma Suraj and this was attended by the South African minister of international affairs and the Brazilian deputy minister of foreign affairs. Now the outcome of this particular meeting it was a document which is very important that is IPSA declaration on South-South cooperation so this is important. This particular document it calls for contribution of each of the member of the IPSA forum that is India, Brazil and South Africa to contribute towards greater development and to foster the development cooperation as a common endeavor of the global south. So this IPSA forum it focuses on development of the global south. Now let us briefly look at this IPSA dialogue forum. Now this dialogue forum it comprises India, Brazil and South Africa and it was established in 2003 and it was by a brasilia declaration which was there by the external affairs ministers of india brazil and 
South Africa. The main objective of this particular grouping, it includes to promote South-South cooperation. Because all these countries, that is India, Brazil and South Africa, they lie in the South, that is India is in South Asia, Brazil in South America and South Africa, again in South, uh, Southern region of Africa. Now, another objective is to build consensus on the issues of international importance, which are of common international importance to all these member countries, such as UN Security Council reforms and reforms in Bretton Woods organizations, for, that is the IMF and World Bank. Another objective is to increase the trade and exchange of information opportunities between the countries and to reduce the poverty across the globe. Now let's move to the next one which is about the new information repository which is to be set up by RBI. So RBI has recently decided to set up a public credit repository which is expected to foster the level of access to credit and strengthen the credit future. So this public credit repository is going to be the single point with regard to mandatory reporting of all the material events which happen with regard to every loan not withstanding any threshold limit in the loan amount or the type of borrower. So this repository it will have all the different records with regard to each and every loan and if there is anything which happens in that loan it is going to be recorded in this particular repository. This repository it will serve as a registry of all the credit contracts. So it will have information on all the credit contracts which are going to be duly verified by the reporting financial institutions or banks. And the RBI considered the recommendations of M. Diostala headed high level task force and this was on the recommendations of this task force that this public credit repository has been set up. Now an implementation task force is also being constituted to help design and undertake the logistics for next steps in the setting up of this public credit repository. Now let us briefly look at the key recommendations of this YM Deosthale committee recommendations. So this committee it was set up by RBI and it submitted its report in April 2018. Now the major recommendations of this report they include setting up of a public credit repository which should be backed by a legal framework. This repository should be having a record of all the loan contracts which should be duly verified by all the reporting institutions for all the lending in the country irregardless of the amount of the loan. So all the loan contracts in the economy they should be there in this particular repository. So it should capture all kinds of data with respect to external commercial borrowings or even contingent liabilities and in this way it will provide a overall holistic picture about any borrower's indebtedness. So the registry should capture both positive and negative information about all the loans. So th this will have all the information with respect to the loans and this repository shall be available to all the stakeholders such as banks on a need to know basis. Further there will be adequate safeguards with regard to privacy protection and the database should also be linked to defaulted databases which are maintained by other organizations like Export Credit Guarantee Corporation of India GST Network etc. So this is about the recommendations of this committee with regard to public credit registry. Now here the most important thing is that we have to remember that this committee recommendations were responsible for the setting up of public credit repository as this can be directly asked in the examination. Now let's move to the next one which is about the new data on maternal mortality rate in the country. So the Registrar General of India has recently released new data which has shown a significant decline in the maternal mortality rate of the country. Now according to WHO, this maternal mortality, it refers to death of a woman either in pregnancy or within 40 days of, 40, 42 days of termination of pregnancy. And this is irrespective of the duration, site of the pregnancy or any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy. But it should not be from accidental or incidental causes. So we have to remember this limit of 42 days which is there by WHO with regard to maternal mortality. Now this is the rate of death of such women per 1 lakh live births. So it is not measured in terms of 100 or 1000 live births. It is measured in terms of 1 lakh live births. The maternal and child mortality and morbidity they are taken as 
important health indicators because they reflect the state of a female healthcare in the country. The global MMR for year 1990 it was 385 and overall progress has been made since then and this number in 2017 it should at 2016 and most of the global maternal deaths they are occurring in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asian countries. So South Asian countries and these sub-Saharan African countries they are the key focus of reducing this maternal mortality rate. And if we look at India's case in 2011 to 13 period, India's MMR was 167. Now, according to recent data released, the India's MMR for the 2014 to 16 period, it stands at 130. And if we look at the top three best and worst performing states with respect to MMR, they are the best three states. They include Kerala, Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu. And the three worst states, they include Assam, UP and Rajasthan. So this is the information with regard to the current uh, data which has been released recently with respect to maternal mortality rate. Further significant decline from 246 to 188 has been seen in the so-called empowered action group states and Assam. Now these empowered action group states are those where economic and develop indica development indicators are a particular concern. So now these states are improving in re with regard to MMR. So this is a sign of positive positivity for the country as a whole and these states include Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand and Uttar Pradesh. So we are seeing improvement in these states so this is an improvement. Now we need to remember the basic aspects that MMR of the uh, country has reduced to 130 and the top three st best states uh, the first one we have to remember is Kerala and the in the three worst states we have to remember is the worst case is the Assam. So this is some of the information which we need to remember for our examination. So now let's move to the next one which is about the Andhra Pradesh being the first state to use auto disable syringes. So Andhra Pradesh is going to be the first state in the country to take this particular move to use auto disable string syringes. And this is going to be enforced from the World Hepatitis Day on July 28th. Now, auto disable syringes, they are those medical syringes which cannot be reused in any case. So, they have this particular mechanism which is there in these syringes. And, and this mechanism allows to break or lock a, a syringe plunger when injection is given to make syringe inoperable for being used for second time. Now, the crux of the discussion is that these types of syringes, they are auto disabled and cannot be used again so this is very essential for preventing the spread of infections in the country so with regard to this andhra pradesh we have to remember that it is the state which has taken the first step and it has become the first state and we have to remember that world hepatitis day on july 28th is going to be the date from which this move is going to come in force in the state now let's move to the next one which is about the 11th geo intelligence asia 2018 so the 11th edition of Geo Intelligence Asia 2018, it was recently held at Manek Shaw Center in New Delhi, India from 4th to 5th June 2018. So this Geo Intelligence Asia, it was held in India recently and the aim of this event, it was to showcase the different innovative applications of geospatial technologies. So this event, it was organized by geospatial media and communication with Director General of Information System as Knowledge Partner and Military Survey as Co-Organizers. So this was basically to showcase the different applications of geospatial technologies. So this is basically the space technology and how we can monitor the earth using the space and different applications can be made out for out of this. The theme it was geospatial, a force multiplier for defense and internal security. And because of this particular theme, uh, there were different participants from the defense and internal security background and they included the military and the other security officials including the border security force, police forces, government and the industry. So you have to remember that this 11th Geo Intelligence Asia 2018, it was held in New Delhi, India and its theme was Geospatial, a force multiplier for defense and internal security. Now let's move to the next one which is about the declaration of queuing pineapple as the state fruit of Tripura. So President Ramnath Kovind, he has recently declared 
three pros queen variety pineapple as a state fruit and this queen pineapple it is spiny golden yellow in color with a pleasant aroma and flavor with unique sweetness and a unique aroma which differentiates it from the other varieties of pineapple and it received this geographical identification tag in 2015 and this was held by the northeastern regional agriculture marketing corporation further APEDA, that is Agriculture and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority, which is an apex organization under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. It also helped in export of key variety of pineapples from Tripura to West Asia, where this pineapple has a huge market. So you have to remember that this queen pineapple has been recently declared as state fruit of Tripura and it has been accorded geographical identification tag. Now, next one is about Operation Nistar. Now, this is about the Indian Navy evacuating Indian nationals from Yemen. So, recently, the Indian nationals, they were rescued from the cyclone hit Socotra Island in Yemen. And this was under the swift humanitarian and disaster relief operation, which was code named as Operation Nistar. So, this can be directly asked in the examination that what is this Operation Nistar related to. So, we have to remember that this is for evacuating Indian nationals from Yemen. In the case of cyclone hit Socotra Island. Now, due to this cyclone, uh, the Indian nationals were stranded for nearly 10 days and this severe cyclonic storm by the name of Makuno, it devastated the entire Socotra Island. So, in this regard, Indian Navy it decided to deploy INS Sunana from the Gulf of Eden to Socotra Island for search and rescue operations and after it received this distress call, from this Directorate General of Shipping and Indian Sailing Vessels Association. So, in this regard, INS Sunana from India was deployed. Now, Indian naval ship INS Sunana it successfully evacuated 38 Indian nationals after it entered Poor Bandar Harbor in Gujarat. Next one is about rural sanitation crossing the 85% mark. So, under the Swachh Bharat Mission, which is the largest behavior change program in the world, the rural sanitation coverage has increased and it has now become around 85%. Now, if you look at the progress that we have made with regard to rural sanitation, 7.4 crore toilets they have been built across India and over 3.8 lakh villages and 391 districts they have been declared as open and defecation free. Further, the two independent surveys which are conducted by Quality Council of India and NSSO, they have pegged the usage of the toilets at 91 and 95% respectively. The toilet usage in the country has increased to 90 to 95% levels and the Swachh Bharat mission in this regard is the first sanitation measure to measure outcomes, outcomes as ODF instead of output toilets alone. So, we have we have taken this initiative that under the Swachh Bharat mission that the output is not simply measured by the construction of toilets. It will be measured by the use of to toilets that is being declared as open defecation free. So the mission uh, emphasis that is Swachh Bharat mission's emphasis it is on behavior change as the key component. Now let us briefly look at this Swachh Bharat mission. So it was launched in October 2014 uh, to achieve universal sanitation coverage in the country and it aims to achieve Swachh Bharat or to make India clean by 2019 which is 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. It is the world's largest sanitation program and it seeks to bring the behavioral change in the people of the country with regard to usage of toilets. It has two components, one is the Grameen or the rural component and the other one is the urban, urban component and this is implemented in the rural and urban areas respectively. Now, Swachh Bharat Mission Grameen, it seeks to eliminate open defecation in rural areas and it also seeks to generate awareness to motivate communities so that they use sustainable sanitation practices and they encourage the use of appropriate technologies for sanitation. Now, let's move to the next one, which is about the commissioning of ICGS C439. So, Indian Coast Guard has recently, in June 2018, it has commissioned an interceptor boat ICGS C439 at the Neville Dockyard in Mumbai, Maharashtra. So, we can be asked a question in this regard that recently this ICGS C439 was in news. It is, what, which one of the following? So, we have to remember that it is an interceptor ship which has been recently commissioned by the Indian Coast Guard. So, it was commissioned by the additional director General K. Natarajan of the Coast Guard. And the ceremony it was attended by senior dignitaries from the central state government and the armed forces. And this ICGS C439 it is designed by LNT Marine and Ship 
design division which is an in house facility of larson and tubro limited this vessel has these are the technical specifications with regard to the vessel which are not very much important but just a reading would suffice so the vessel is 24 7.4 meter long and the displacement of 136 tons it can achieve a maximum speed of 45 knots and the important aspect which you have to remember is that this vessel is going to operate under the operational and administrative control of commander coast guard district headquarter number two in maharashtra mumbai so we have to remember that this one is an interceptor ship of the indian coast guard which is going to be operational under the control of maharashtra or mumbai division so next one is about the world oceans day which was observed on 8th of june 2018 so world ocean day is being observed every year on 8th of june and the objective is to raise the global awareness with respect to the challenges which the international community is facing with regard to the oceans so world oceans day it seeks to provide this opportunity to honor protect and conserve the world's oceans and the focus of this particular day and the focus of this particular day in 2018 that is the theme of 2018 world oceans day it is to prevent plastic pollution and encourage solutions for a healthy ocean so we have to combat plastic pollution and this also coincided with the theme of the world environment day which was also to beat plastic pollution the un general assembly had designated 8th june as the world oceans day in 2008 in 1992, Canada had proposed that we should celebrate this day at Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And since 2003, this day has been coordinated by the Ocean Project. So we have to remember that June 8th is the World Oceans Day. And for this particular year, that is 2018, the theme was to prevent plastic pollution. Now let's move to the next one, which is about the government raising five Indian Reserve Police Battalions in JNK. So central government has decided to raise five Indian Reserve Police Battalions in Jammu and Kashmir and the aim is to provide jobs to local youth. So it is going to provide security as well as jobs to the people in JNK. So there will be having 60% reservation to people from the borders of JNK and the five battalions they will have over 5000 people and 60% will be given to the people who live in 0 to 10 kilometer range from the border. Besides, there will be two female battalions which comprise 1,000 women personnel and the women battalion it will primarily deal with the incidents like stone pelting in Kashmir, Valley and other law and order duties. The Ministry of Home Affairs it deploys the personnel of this reserve battalions, it is Indian Reserve Police Battalions in the respective states but they can also be deployed in the other states if there is requirement. So you have to remember that five reserve battalions are to come up in JNK with 60% reservation of the people of uh, JNK only. There are going to be two female battalions and uh, the overall the Ministry of Home Affairs, it is the coordinating authority with respect to deployment of these battalions. Now let's move to the next one, which is about the FDI in India rising to US dollar 61.96 billion in 2017-18. So according to DIPP, that is Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, FDI or the Foreign Direct Investment in India it has increased. It has increased to dollar 61.96 billion in 2017-18. Now FDI inflows in the previous year they were around US dollar 60 billion, and in the last four years the FDI inflows has jumped to US dollar. 4222.75 billion from the earlier US dollar 152 billion. The main sectors which are received the maximum FTA in the country they were the services sector, computer software sector, hardware, telecommunications, construction, trading, and automobile. So these were the major sectors receiving FTA. And the main sources of FDA to India they included. Mauritius, Singapore, Japan, Netherlands, US, Germany, France and UAE. So these are the countries from which major FDI came into the country. However, according to the recent UNCTAD report, that is United Nations Conference on Trade and Development report, FDI to India it decreased to US dollar 40 billion in 2017 from US dollar 44 billion in 2016. While the outflows from India it has doubled. So this was as per the recent UNCTAD report. Now let's move to the next one which is about the five new countries being elected as non-permanent 
members of UN Security Council. So recently United Nations General Assembly, it elected five members that is South Africa, Indonesia, Dominican Republic, Germany and Belgium as non-permanent members of UN Security Council. Now these members they are going to have a two year term beginning from January 1, 2019. Now these five non-permanent members they were elected according to this particular pattern or criteria. Two seats were there for the group of African states and a group of Asia Pacific states. One was there for Latin American and Caribbean states and two seats were there for the Western European and other states. So we have to remember that these five countries they have been elected for a two year term in the United Nations Security Council and as non-permanent members. Now let us briefly look at the United Nations Security Council. Now this United Nations Security Council is one of the most powerful organs of the United Nations and this has the primary responsibility of maintaining international peace and security. This council has 15 members and out of the 15 members there are 5 permanent ones and the 5 permanent ones they include China, France, Russia, UK and US. So these are the 5 permanent members and they have also been given the veto power that is they can veto any particular decision and even if the one country it vetoes any particular decision the decision will not come into effect. Further there are 10 non-permanent members and they are elected for 2 year terms each. So there are 10 non-permanent members and 5 permanent members in UN Security Council. The powers of UNSC they include establishing peacekeeping operations, imposing international sanctions and authorizing military actions. Also, it is the only UN body which has the authority to issue binding resolutions to member states. So, you have to remember all these aspects about UN Security Council. Now, next let's move to the Global Peace Index 2018. So, recently Global Peace Index 2018, it was released and under this particular index, India has moved one notch higher to 136th position. So, India is at 136th position in this 2018 Global Peace Index which has been released by International Think Tank Institute for Economics and Peace. So this was the 12th edition of this Global Peace Index and it was started initially in 2006. And according to this particular index, the global level of peace it is deteriorating and it has deteriorated by 0.27% in last year. A total of 71 countries have shown improvement in their rankings on the index while 92 countries have shown deterioration. Iceland was the first in the list and it has held this first position since 2008. It was followed by New Zealand and Austria. Syria remains the least peaceful country in the world. So this is important that the least peaceful country in the world as per the Global Peace Index 2018, it is Syria. Four most peaceful regions they include Europe, North America, Asia Pacific and South America. However, all of these regions have recorded deteriorations in the peace. So you have to remember all these aspects about the Global Peace Index 2018 and the most important one is the rank of India which is 136th. Now let us briefly look at the basic aspects of this Global Peace Index. Now this Global Peace Index is a measure of world peace and it is the one of the leading measures with respect to global peacefulness and another important aspect is that it is produced by the Institute for Economics and Peace which is a Sydney based international and independent think tank. So we have to remember that this is a Sydney based international and independent think tank which is dedicated to shift the world's focus to peace and as a positive achievable and tangible measure of human well-being. So it, it says that we should move towards promotion of global peace. This particular index that is global peace index it is composed of 23 ind indicators and they include the nation's level of military expenditure to its relation with the neighboring countries and the percentage of prison population. So this is the basic aspect of Global Peace Index. So guys, this was all about our discussion on some of the very important current affairs from the 5th of June 2018 to 9th of June 2018. Thank you guys. If you found this video useful, please like the same and share it with your friends. And for more similar videos, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Thank you.